All right, welcome. We're glad you're here. And if you uh, are not here in person, you just missed your secretary, Judy, singing Child of the King. So maybe just stop by the office sometime and ask her to sing it for you. And she'll do that. So thank you all for being here today. What a beautiful, beautiful week it's turned out to be. And uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer. We've already prayed here for several needs, one of them being uh, Bridget uh, Mann, Dylan's wife, who's uh, carrying a baby that's 27 weeks, and there's some complications. Uh, they're in the hospital. Let's pray for the doctors. To, uh, that the Lord would give them wisdom. Pray for Dylan and Bridget in their concern, and Wendy and the family, and the baby. Ask God to just protect that little life. And also Jack Taylor, uh, we pray for him. We pray for our youth. Uh, got a great report. I'll share something with you in a few minutes about that. But uh, the junior high finished their camp tomorrow. They'll be home late tomorrow evening. And uh, we pray for uh, Kasia, Jennifer, and Jason Hoke, who are serving as chaperones. And it sounds like they've had a great week. Also, right now, going on right now at Tri-Village High School, there is a basketball camp. Aaron Kraft from Ohio State and Dallas Lauderdale from Ohio State are leading it. They are both born-again Christians, and today they're doing two camps. And then this evening at Tri-Village, they're having a service uh, where the gospel will be presented, and, uh, and they're praying for a packed gym. So pray for that right now. Kyle, my son-in-law's church, is one of the sponsors of that, and uh, this is a big day, so we pray for that right now, okay? God, the, the many needs in the life of the church, these are just ones we know. And we do pray for uh, Bridget and Dylan and the baby right now that you would help them, God, and just uh, wrap your arms around them to uh, strengthen them and, and to bring them into better health. God, we pray for that. We also ask, Lord, that you'd be at the youth, uh, these junior high students whose lives will be forever shaped uh, by, by the gospel and the impact that this week has made. I pray for Kasia. Uh, Jennifer and Jason, thank you for all those that helped support these youth by praying for them. And many, many folks in the church uh, supported financially. We thank you for that. We pray for Jack Taylor, uh, our shut-ins, and the many needs in the life of our church. God, we lift them up to you. We pray for our community today and ask that you would help. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, I think we're going to be in chapter 10. And this morning I want to speak uh, on the theme of supernatural. Uh, now, most of you realize I didn't record anything last week being at camp on Wednesday, and I didn't do anything Sunday, so my mom is hot after me to get back after it, and I'm ready to go. And today we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I hope you'll jo jo join us Sunday as we continue on looking at a remarkable story in the, the life of Elisha. Uh, and then it's hard to believe that July 4th is a week from Sunday if the Lord tarries. So a lot going on, and we praise God for that. Um, I, here's a prayer request that I would have for you all and, and for the church uh, about what direction we're going to go in the fall with the kids. Um, we have uh, been involved in Awana for a number, a number of years. And uh, I, I almost feel like there for a little while toward the end of it, we were missing the mark. Um, a program does not necessarily mean uh, it's for everybody. I think, it, I think they can be for everybody for a time. Uh, we were involved in something prior to Awana called Team Kid, K-I-D, Kids and Discipleship. Uh, it was a good program. And uh, so just pray as we make that decision. Make, uh, I mean, we certainly will have kids ministry but it may look a little different than it has in, in years past. So um, uh, I, don't, I don't want you hearing that and saying, oh man, Brother Greg, we don't love Jesus anymore because we're not doing Awana. I'm not saying we're not, but we may not. Uh, we may do something different in the, in the fall. To tell you the truth, um, during Bible school, and uh, Marcia had the preschoolers, and she said, on night one, I've got to shift gears with the preschoolers and what we're, what we're singing. And those kids just started singing uh, Deep and Wide, the B-I-B-L-E. And they let it rip on family night. Uh, and it, it really kind of blessed my heart. Uh, do you remember the days of, of uh, sword drills, Bible sword drills? You guys know what that is? It, it's really kind of, 
a competition. But more than that, these kids learn scripture and, uh, and you give them the opportunity to quote it and recite it and pull them up on stage and give them an opportunity to, to show the skills they're learning with scripture. And I can remember someone in our church growing up, Nadine and Margaret Pugh. Neither one were married and they would make an announcement to the church, if you'd like to be part of the, of the Bible sword drill, we're going to start practicing next Sunday after church, bring a, ba a bag lunch. Y'all remember the days of brown bag lunches? Mm -hmm. bring, a, bring a sack lunch, and they would work on that stuff. And uh, uh, So what I'm saying is, it may be time for us to just get back to the basics. Last night, Renee fixed... Um, you ready for this? She fixed fried potatoes, pinto beans, cornbread, and like cut up pola sausage. I've never had a better meal in my life, beans and potatoes. And I think sometimes there's nothing wrong with doing basic stuff. There's nothing wrong with singing Silent Night at Christmas. Are you with me? Uh, there's nothing wrong with singing Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory on July 4th Celebration Sunday. Uh, so just pray with us as we make those decisions and we'll, we'll try to make the best ones that we feel God's leading. But that's just food for thought, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want, I want to speak uh, for a few minutes today on, and ask you this question. Do you really believe in the supernatural? I mean, do you really believe that God can do something that man can't? And I think our answer would be what? Absolutely yes. He has power to do anything, and He has created us. The creation is never greater than the Creator, and He uses things for His glory to not just get our attention, but that they would, uh, they would point to Him, the things that would point to Him. Um, Someone said today, I read, that the goal of prayer is to glorify God regardless of the answer. So if God doesn't give me the answer I want, it may be God's will that that's not what I get. So the goal of prayer would be to glorify God with the, with the outcome. And man, we can, we can, can we not, we can glorify God when we, something goes from negative to positive and, and we can praise the Lord. But sometimes I, I, sometimes we get disappointed when things are not answered the way we think they should be answered. So today I want to remind you of the supernatural power of God. First Corinthians chapter 10, and I'll start with verse 1, 10, 1. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now here's, here's a picture of that 40-year wilderness, wilderness trip. And keep in mind, of the generation, Joshua and Caleb were the only two men of that generation that made it in because they believed God and His promises. If you recall, the other spies didn't even get, get there. But God provided for faithfulness. Verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some did. And in one day uh, 23,000 fell, uh, referring to numbers. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents nor complain as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. 
And many of you might have verse 13 circled or underlined. If you don't, this would be a good time to do it. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and then when you flip 13 to 31, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, the Bible says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Now, Paul would not say he's perfect, and Paul certainly had so much regret about his life before Christ. But when Jesus changed him, his life was radically changed. As a matter of fact, if you look at chapter 11, verse 1, he says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. His desire was to live for Jesus. His desire was for people to see Christ in his life. A while back, uh, uh, there was a meeting involving a church, and the church was considering closing their doors and selling the building. The reason, no people, no burden, no passion, they were unable to pay the bills. And the question was asked, do you still believe God does miracles? Do you still believe God does miracles? And of course they did. Of course they did. Um, there's a song, have you, uh, do you all remember the Greens, the Singing Greens? They were a trio. Um, they sang a song entitled, Miracle in Me. These are some of the lyrics. I have never seen 5,000 fed or the blinded eye to see. I have never uh, watched him raise the dead, but I know he lifted me. Uh, these aren't right, but there's a wonder right before my eyes, close enough to see. And if my heart is where my wonder lies, there's a miracle in me. So when you think about miracles, we see that on a, on a daily basis uh, as people come to Christ, as lives are changed. And the greatest miracle, folks, is not somebody being healed of cancer. The greatest miracle is you and me and that, and that, and that person prayerfully being healed of sin and are going to live forever. Um, there is a video clip out right now by a fellow named Alistair Begg. Does that name ring a bell to any of you? He's a pastor in the Cleveland area. I think uh, a Presbyterian maybe, a Bible preacher. And uh, very well respected around the world. Has this uh, Scottish accent. And he, he was talking about God's grace and the miracle of being saved. And uh, he said, let me use the thief on the cross as an example. As he gets to heaven, and perhaps an angel, an angel meets him, and, and, and now use your imagination, and begins to ask him some questions. Now who's he talking about? The thief on the cross. And he says, how do you feel about the doctrine of justification? And he goes, that thief had to have looked at the angel and said, I don't know. Well, what, how do you feel about uh, uh, the doctrine of baptism? Remember the thief on the cross. And he responds, I don't know. Then what are you doing here? The angel says to him. And the, and the thief responds, all I can tell you, listen, to this, this is good. All I can tell you is the man on the middle cross said that I could come. Isn't that awesome? You'll find that on social media. It's a two-minute clip. The man on the middle cross said that I could come. You know why? Because he was dying for that man. Jesus was dying for him just as he died for us. And, uh, and I praise the Lord. Listen, folks, that's the miracle. Amen? That's the miracle. So supernatural is where Jesus meets your life. So Kasia sent me a clip last night, and they, they, they gave an invitation last night at junior high camp. 
two, two invitations, one to be saved and another to recommit your life. And she said what they did last night was they put something on the ground in, this, in the worship center, like maybe at the altar, and when a person came up and stood on that, whatever was on the ground, it shot a, a, a symbol, a Greek symbol for Jesus. It shot that up on the wall. You know how sometimes I, I feel like I wish uh, when someone makes a decision, a, a little cloud would pop above your head and I would know that the decision had been made? Well, in essence, that's what was happening last night. So uh, she sent me this video and you just see it, one, one there, one there, and it was just an indicator that decisions were being made. Uh, listen to me. The greatest miracle, the greatest supernatural thing that's ever taken place is Jesus dying, being raised from the dead, and coming to live in your heart and my heart as a believer. That's, um, that's supernatural. So he does an inside-out work. Okay. Now in this passage... Paul's reminding believers that it's easy to assemble your life without following God's instructions. If you ever bought something and it says, um, assembly required? Any of you ever stayed up late on Christmas Eve trying to put something together for a grandkid that you thought would be easier than expected? Um, uh, Roy Howe recently bought a new grill, and boy, he was so proud of that grill, he brought it home in the box, and, and uh, somebody said, Roy, you know they put those together free for you there, don't you? Don't you? He goes, what? He said, yeah, they assemble that stuff for free. You know what Roy did? He returned it and said, I'd like to buy another one, and you assemble it. That was just smart. That was just good thinking. And uh, so, instructions. God gives instructions, and the church of Corinth could not blame their failures on not receiving instructions. He said, you're wealthy, you've got a privilege, but you're living below your privilege. You're, you're living b below it. So what privilege did they have? If you want to take a few notes, here's a few. First of all, they had supernatural guidance. So as a believer, when you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit wants to direct us and guide us. We have the Word of God, amen? And the Bible says it's a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. So it tells me where I'm at, and it shows me where I'm going. Now, I, I have noticed this the last few days. It sure does sound like the cicada chorus is just about over. Does it sound like that around your home? Is that true? Is it fading out now? Is it riding out into the sunset? I told Renee, my luck as a cicada would, be, would have been this. I would have waited 17 years to come alive, and one, as soon as I come alive, a bird would eat me. What a short life that was, right? What a short life that was. Now, mark your Bible here, because I want to show you something. Okay, so put your marker in your Bible and go to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, chapter 13. So Paul uses the example of the Israelites in the wilderness. They had supernatural guidance. Beginning with verse 17. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had placed the children of Israel under Solomon, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here with you. So they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham at the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cl a cloud to lead the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people." 
Paul is reminding us that God gives spiritual guidance. Now, I would really like to say that God gives us a cloud every day and a fire every night. Uh, Lord, show us, show me. He may not do that, but it's obvious here that the Israelites weren't ready for what God had for them because he even changed routes, thinking they might, war might really cause them to want to go back to Egyptian bondage. Now we know in the next few chapters, they wanted to do that anyway. Um, their water's bad and they start blaming, they're murmuring, they're complaining. Uh, that's just the nature of people sometimes. We were at camp and I told Kasia this, I think boys whine more than girls. That's why I told her. I had, you know, we had the boys and I was trying to make a point in front of the boys uh, that, uh, that whining is not attractive. Okay? Anybody want to say amen? Amen. All right. They had the same privilege, but privilege doesn't save you. Okay? To be guided supernaturally, they all had the same privilege, but the privilege did not save all. Now, uh, look at chapter 14. They not only had spiritual guidance, something else takes place. Chapter 14, verse 21 Okay, they're at the Red Sea. Moses stretches out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel were in, into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. Here's something else they had. God rescued them. He had freed them, and now he would continue to save them. They, had, uh, they not only had spiritual guidance, they had spiritual deliverance, a supernatural deliverance that God provided. Something supernatural about passing this way, I don't know about you all, but it sure seems like there should be mud somewhere. There should be mud somewhere, and God allows them all to pass on dry ground. Um, years ago, uh, I worked third shift for six years, and a, a lot of times we would play golf after we worked, so we would play in the morning. And we were playing at a course in Trotwood, and I was playing with a buddy of mine named Dan Bowers, and Dan uh, had hit his ball right, and I had hit my ball left, just like good golfers do. He started walking that way, I started walking this way. When he got over there, he said, Greg, Greg, look at this, look at this. And I said, what? He goes, come here. And there were golf balls laying everywhere in this field. Everywhere. He said, what is this? I said, I don't know. He goes, I'm going to get some. And he took a step toward a golf ball and dropped in mud up to here. It was a, it was a pond or a lake or something that had been drained. He dropped to here and began to panic like quicksand. And uh, so I, I had my golf clubs. I took a golf club out. He grabbed it, and we kind of yanked him, you know, over to safety. And when he got up, he had shorts on, and it was black, stinky mud. I, I, I've never laughed so hard in my life. So we went down the hill to a little a pump room uh, and... Uh, started turn a faucet on and started blasting him off and about that time a cart came down the hill and a groundskeeper said what are you guys doing what are you doing and we said we're trying to brush this mud off of him and he said you've just cut the power or you've just cut the pressure of the water on the course what's my what's my story a, a golf ball a bunch of golf balls laying in an open area may not be the best place to step right there's a reason they're there and the miracle of crossing the Red Sea is even more amplified when you think the Bible says they crossed on dry ground. That's crazy. That, wall, that water becomes walls. We're not talking about a built dam. We're talking about a supernatural deliverance that God stops it and says, I'm going to give you an aisle to cross over. And by the way, I'll take care of your enemy once they step in. So God had given supernatural leadership. Now, um, 
1 Corinthians talks about being baptized into Moses. What's that mean? Identifying with Moses. So those of you that are here that have given your life to Christ and you've followed in believers' baptism by immersion, you identify with Christ, right? You identify. Uh, if you want to dye a garment, if you want to dye a, 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 a top a different color, you have to immerse it for it to identify with that. So baptism's a picture. We, we had uh, six decisions in Bible school. Two of those kids are ready to be baptized. And, and what they're, what they're going to say in their baptism is, I, I identify with Christ. Okay? Identify with Christ. Um, look at chapter 14 in Exodus again, verse 31. Then Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. And as a matter of fact, they not only believe it, chapter 15 is a song of praise that the Bible says Moses and the children of Israel sing. And when you look at the words, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider. So, so they're looking at uh, the Red Sea crossing with victorious, uh, with victorious hearts, and they're, they're pumped up. God has provided, God has provided, and he's destroyed our enemy. But it doesn't stop with supernatural deliverance. It doesn't stop with supernatural deliverance. God gave... In 1 Corinthians, he gave supernatural leadership. Um, let me read that to you. Back in 1 Corinthians, verse 2, they say, All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So by faith, God led the picture of, of uh, trusting God and, and being delivered. God uses supernatural leadership. The Israelites had been, had been immersed with Moses. Um, is, Israel's cycle is something like this. Follow God, disobey God, recognize your disobedience has cost you, repent, turn from your sin, turn back to God, and continue on. That was a repetitive cycle of the children of Israel heading to the promised land. Okay? Supernatural leadership. Now, let me ask you all this. Did Moses get to the promised land? He didn't, did he? Does anybody know why Moses didn't get to the promised land? Okay, go ahead. He was supposed to speak to the rock and he did Okay. Well, it sure does sound like a, a simple thing to keep somebody from who's, who God faithfully used up to that point. But what's, what's the lesson? God gives instructions to be followed. And in a simple change of what God wanted to do, Moses appeared to be the one doing it when he hit the rock. And God said, speak to it. And because of that, he would see the promised land, but he wouldn't be able to cross over. So who does God raise up to do it? Joshua. And Joshua's been watching Moses this whole time. He's watching him lead. Okay, He's watching him lead. Uh, supernatural leadership. Here, there's something else that God does. In the wilderness, he, he gave them supernatural food. Do we believe in the supernatural? Absolutely. The Old Testament is full of God providing. Deuteronomy 8, 14, when, you lift your, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of, out of rock. Listen, God would provide what you need with supernatural food, manna from heaven, and supernatural drink, he would turn bad water into good water. In Exodus chapter 15, they're three days out on their journey, and they find out that the water is so bitter you can't drink it. Um, most of you know that the house we live in, 
was the church parsonage. Uh, we, the church sold it to us, I don't know, 16 or 17 years ago. When we first came out here, we still had a house in Dayton. We were still living in Dayton, but we would come to Camden on Saturday night and stay all night. Our kids were little. The church, um, the church let us borrow stuff, furniture. So we had everything in the house was borrowed. Uh, I mean, we had, a, we had the look back then of a 1965 retro house, uh, things that people uh, weren't using but helped us with end tables and lamps and all that kind of stuff. And, and we would come and, and we, would, we would stay all night at the parsonage on Saturday night and then all day Sunday. Uh, one reason really is we weren't going home on Sunday. We would stay here. So it gave us, gave us a home uh, while we were here. I can remember coming to the parsonage on some of those early Saturday nights and we would start taking showers and baths. And I had never smelled sulfur like I smelled. When we would get out of the shower, I asked Renee, do I smell like dial or do I smell like rotten eggs? Because we weren't used to that. And, and we found out one of those reasons was obviously some of us from not, not being used. So uh, that cleared up, but I can always remember that. Uh, boy, we sure did take a good shower, but, but I don't feel clean. God not only gives supernatural food, he gives supernatural drink. Uh, he gave a cloud to lead. He said, I'll give you deliverance from the Red Sea, and I'll give you a leader, Moses. And remember Moses uh, protested when God called him that I, I, I can't speak like you want me to speak. And God says, well, your brother Aaron can, and he'll be with you. Okay? He says, I'll give you food, and I'll give you drink. I'll, I'll give you things that you don't even ask for if you follow me because I know what you need. And that's a picture of grace. That's a picture of the grace of God. And when God meets our needs, it really is an act of grace. He doesn't have to, but He does. Um, I want you to think back to your own lives right now as you listen and as you're watching. Um, can you think of some times in your life when you've seen God's grace? God's grace. Um, we're in the process of working on our laundry room. Um, everything's in disarray. Uh, Drew, our son, came yesterday and put down a floor for us. So we just shoved our washer and dryer back into place without connecting them. And this morning, Renee was gone, and I went in there, and there was something, I heard something, like a creature. And I thought, what in the world? And then I realized that it was something in the dryer duct that was going up out of the ceiling. And every time I would shake that, whatever was in there would move. So I'm thinking, what is in there? Right? So I went inside opened the back door out that leads out of the house, shut the door that leads into the hallway, because this creature gets out, it's, it's, it's staying right here in this room, right? And I thought, okay, I'm going to pick up that dryer vent and put something like a shoe. I found a shoebox lid, and I'm going to trap it. Whatever it is, I'm going to trap it, because... This is something that I probably should call a pro at to come help me with because I don't know what it is and it could be very dangerous and, and look out. So I, I trapped it and I shook that, that uh, foil, that, that, uh, that popcorn foil looking stuff you use for a dryer vent and I could feel it. I could feel it kind of fighting it and moving it and I said, okay, it's, it's there. Had the door open. I took the lid off and just started shaking it. And I thought, man, what's coming out? A raccoon or a, a snake or what, what's in here? And a little pretty bluebird just flew out of the house. Let me tell you something. That bluebird owes me its life. Because it probably would have just died there. As believers sitting here, do we not owe God everything? 
Do we not owe God everything? Uh, you see, when he meets our needs, it's an act of grace. And Paul was saying that's exactly what God's going to do. And where do you find, where, where, where can you see God's grace? Well, I, I saw it this morning with a bird, but where do you see it? Acts 46.10, does anybody know that verse? You all know it. Be still and know I am God. Right? Be still and know that I'm God. Um, Numbers 14.30 says, Except for Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. Why did they get there? They all had the same privilege. They just didn't trust the supernatural power and presence of God. Having privileges does not guarantee success. Having privileges does not guarantee success. Um, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10. And we'll kind of wrap up here. Paul makes it very clear. He says, now these things became, th these were examples that we learned from. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So Paul gives us Corinthians some directions. He says, don't crave evil things. Don't feed your sinful hunger or nature. Okay. In 2004, uh, I, I imagine I'm, uh, there might be some fans sitting right in here. In 2004, the Rolling Stones song, Satisfaction, you know what I'm talking about? Was considered to be on the greatest 500 songs of all times. And that song talks about looking for contentment, of trying and trying and trying, but I can't get no satisfaction. He says, don't crave evil things. Another one, don't be idolaters. Idolaters, uh, an, an idol is anything that seizes the adoration that belongs to God. So, so when I start making decisions that I'm just going to quit worshiping, something else has become an idol. When, when worship becomes one of a bunch of stuff in my life and not a main thing in my life, I've let other things become idols. And, and we've got to be very careful. Uh, a job, a goal, uh, an education, money. Those are things that can try to squeeze out our adoration for God. Okay, here's another one. Look at verse 8. Nor let us commit sexual immorality. Don't be immoral. Uh, the Bible tells a story in Numbers chapter 25 that uh, the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to, to the sacrifices of their gods, little g. The people ate and bowed down to their gods. In Israel's heart, uh, they were weeping at the doors of the tabernacle of meeting. Um, the Bible says, when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel, and in that day 24,000, the Bible says, died. Evil attitude, substitute for God, and, and we have the, the opportunity today to just ask God to look at our life. Is there anything inconsistent with what you want to do? And then lastly, don't try God. Don't try God. And that's what Moses did. And, that, and that, Diane, that's what you said. Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. And God said, you're not going to go. You're not going to go. So let me tell you, we, I believe in the supernatural, don't you? I believe when we come together, God can do more in a minute than we can try to make happen in, in all of our lives combined. And that's what we need to be praying for. Okay? That's what we need to be praying for. 
Um, several years ago, I lined the deacons up on the stage in t-shirts and sunglasses. Did anybody re does anybody remember that day? On the, we had black t-shirts on, and on the t-shirt it said, N-O-S-S, -S, squad. Remember back in the day the show Mod Squad? Well, this said N-O-S-S, -S, squad. That simply meant no summer slump. And here's what I'm praying for this summer for us as a church, as, as vacations uh, time really kind of unfolds here, that we would not see any kind of signs like that because we have not been able to be together all together for such a long time that there would be a hunger for worship when we're here. And uh, so continue to pray for, for those that can't make it. Had the, had a great visit yesterday with Howard Cotrere and... Uh, uh, for instance, Greenbrier now, you can visit, but you have to call and make an appointment, and you have to present proof that you've had both shots. Um, I think what some of these facilities are, are wanting to do is make sure that we don't carry sickness in. Um, so um, Somerville is a little different. Uh, we have about five people at Somerville, and when I go there, they, they want me to just go to one patient. They don't want me to go from room to room like we normally would, uh, and they walk you to the room. So I guess that's kind of a state thing. But, but there are different, uh, different things in different places. Kettering Hospital Network seems pretty normal. When you go uh, to a Kettering Hospital, you can go to, up to the room. Um, I think it's two visitors at, at a time, that kind of thing. But you still have to sign in, and they take your temperature and all that. Okay, So things are starting to get back. Uh, to a little bit of a sign of normal. So we praise God. Amen. Let's go ahead and close. And uh, if anybody's watching that's never given their heart to Christ, man, we'd love to talk to you about that. And uh, that Jesus died on the cross to pay a sin debt for you and me that we can never pay ourselves. The Bible says if you call upon him, he'll save you, recognizing that he died for you. So, Lord, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for faithful folks. And I ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us as we continue to go forward. Help us to be reminded, Lord, that you're in the business of doing the supernatural. And I pray that we would not take our eyes off that, that we would not be faint-hearted when we're not seeing it. But as Henry Blackaby continued to write and experience in God, that you're at work, whether we can see it or not, help us to be faithful. So we love you, Lord. Ask that you would go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.